Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul welcomes back Walt Thornhill. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Living 4D with me, Paul Check. In part one of Walt Thornhill and the Electric Universe, we got deep into the nature of the universe from the Electric Universe perspectives. Those of you that listened are aware that the Electric Universe theory seriously challenges many of the long-held and recently cultivated beliefs within mainstream science and cosmology. I was personally surprised with Walt's outright rejection of concepts such as black holes, quantum physics as a whole, and even the photon as a quantum of light. It has always been my approach to holistic thinking and learning to seek out the greatest minds and explore their views of reality, and particularly to explore their opposition to existing models, theories, and beliefs, including my own. Probably the most common response I got from listeners regarding part one of the Electric Universe was mind-blowing. The second most common comment I got was, it was deep, but to be honest, I didn't understand a lot of it. Part of the misunderstanding may be my fault, as the podcast is also a chance for me to dialogue and sometimes even debate my guests with my selfish intention of learning and testing my own theories. My dream as the host of Living 4D is that you enjoy the ride. It is through healthy, heart-centered conflict that we air our differences and get a chance to see the issues of life from perspectives different from our own. Through this kind of dialectic tension, new awarenesses often arise, giving us the opportunity to both grow and develop broader depth and breadth of vision within ourselves and our relationships to ourselves and to other persons, places, and things. In this episode, Awakening to the Electric Universe Part 2 with Walt Thornhill, Chief Science Advisor for both the Thunderbolts Project and the Electric Universe Scientists, Walt and I revisited some of the key concepts covered in Part 1 to offer greater clarity and depth to the concepts of the Electric Universe. We also dive into issues such as consciousness, mind, the known relative to what is unknown, and what the Electric Universe Scientists are working on now, what Walt sees in the future, and how understanding the electric universe theory can support us in living better lives in our day-in and day-out existence. I had a fascinating dialogue with Walt, and I'm very excited to share this dialogue, which brings more clarity to our exploration in Part 1, as well as adding greater depth and dimension to our understanding of many of the concepts used in standard science relative to what the EU scientists, the electric universe scientists, have discovered. As you will soon hear, I won't let Walt off easy with some of his contentions, but he stood firmly in the fires of dialogue and left me even more inspired to learn more. I hope you have the same experience. I hope you enjoy this amazing dialogue as much as I did. Hi, everybody. You know, I've been absolutely digging my cold plunge tub. And unlike all the other cold plunge tubs out there, this one is very, very good looking and has a lot of unique features And I have Mike Garrett here who will share those with you in a minute. Before I get to Mike to share these unique features, I wanted to remind you that yin means increased power or multiplication of power. And one of the things that I absolutely love is I'm a little tired or I want to speed my recovery after a workout. I jump in there for around five minutes at about 50 degrees and I get out of there feeling strong and vital. And I'll tell you what, it's one of the best anti-aging techniques I've ever used. But there's so many more features to the cold plunge tub that make it absolutely the badass tub out there for sure. So, Mike, tell us about the unique features of your cold plunge tub. Sure. So it comes in that acrylic freestanding tub that's beautiful. It's going to last you a lifetime. We also have a hot tub feature. So if you add that to your order, you can turn your cold plunge into a hot tub at a flip of a switch, which is pretty cool. And a big one is the water filtration. So it constantly filters using UV ozone and a five micron carbon filter what that means is you're just going to have crystal clear water all the time and the tub is 39.90 and we do have financing options which is zero percent for six months or you can pay 139 a month for three years to get your cold plunge tub go to thecoldplunge.com slash pages slash check and use the promo code check 150 to get 150 dollars off your order i love it thank you mike Hello, everybody. All of us at the Czech Institute are excited about our new Golf Performance Specialist online training program. I developed the Golf Performance Specialist program myself because there was no program in the world that offered a holistic, integrated approach to assessing the golf athlete and getting them balanced, healthy, and performing better. Through my career as a rehabilitation and performance specialist, I've worked with a long string of golfers that were injured and suffering performance plateaus, 
that weren't getting results until I applied the integrated holistic approach I share in the Golf Performance Specialist Program, which teaches you how to customize your programs to each individual's needs. Most of them, caught in the traditional mindset of trying to adjust swing faults by modifying their stance or buying new golf clubs, only spent thousands of dollars that didn't help their game. But after applying the principles and practices I teach in this program, came to fully realize that it's the golf athlete that plays the game, not the club. Not only does having this specialized training give you the skills to work with some of the most commonly injured athletes and enthusiasts, it gives you access to millions of people that have the finances to afford your expertise. Regardless if you're a physician treating sports injuries, a physical therapist, chiropractor, osteopath, massage therapist, conditioning specialist, or a player that wants to optimize performance, this course teaches you key assessments and how to address common muscle imbalance syndromes, identify and activate inhibited muscles, optimize core function, and clearly shows you how to progress the player through the essential stages of flexibility, stability, strength, and power development. To order your e-learning course now, go to checkinstitute.com forward slash GPS online. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash GPS online. I know you're going to enjoy this course. It's very powerful, very holistic, and it works extremely well. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood Bars. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I'm excited to share Walt Thornhill again for part two of The Electric Universe. The first one was very interesting and exciting and deep. And a lot of the feedback that I got from people was that it was so deep, they had a hard time following it. So I thought this time I would revisit some of the concepts with Walt and try to uh, break it down a little bit. I can't promise you it's going to stay uh, too <laughs> basic because we have to discuss things in a way that they have some meaning for us. So Walt, welcome back to Living 4D. Thanks, Paul, for the opportunity. My pleasure. I really enjoyed our first uh, podcast together and it was fun to listen to and put me into a lot of deep thought again. So it was uh, certainly mm -hmm. a very stimulating discussion. Good. Now, um, for the, those that didn't listen to part one, you'll probably uh, get a lot out of part one to set the context for part two. Well, you're the chief science advisor for the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolts Project. Is that correct? Yes, I'm the uh, author of the Electric Universe. Um, my version anyway, <laughs> uh, but I'm also the chief science advisor to um, the uh, Thunderbolts project. Uh, that's where I got this started with Dave Talbot. He was the chief uh, mytho historian trying to work out what the ancients were trying to tell us, and I had to figure out what the Dickens that meant. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, I think it meant a lot from my studies of what you guys have put together, which is oh, yes. very cool. Mm. So hopefully we'll we'll get into some of that because uh, we didn't really get a chance to dive into that too much last time. And I think that's one of the most fascinating aspects of the Electric Universe uh, model. Do you refer to it as a model? Yes, I would say in many respects it's a full-blown theory because uh, I've made many predictions. Uh, quite outrageous, some of them, and uh, my score is better than 
uh, anything coming out of the uh, modern sciences. Okay, cool. So just for those that didn't hear part one and are jumping into part two, can you just give us an overview of the electric universe theory and why it's important for cosmology and our understanding of the universe, solar system, earth, nature, and even our understanding of the human body? Yes. Uh, as somebody who's helping me uh, work on my book, he said he he's quite amazed at the breadth of material that I've actually covered. And that is the first thing to understand. If I'm trying to produce a new cosmology to replace the present one, uh, it has to answer questions from any, anywhere, any discipline. It has to have relevance to us as human beings, which is something the Big Bang certainly doesn't. Um, and uh, the whole thing has to be coherent. In other words, uh, any problems that are thrown up, the answers should be simple, or at least we should be able to say honestly, we don't yet know there's more work to be done. Right. Okay, so for the listeners who have no background in electronics, could you just give us an overview of what an electric circuit is, such as what are the characteristics of negative polarity relative to positive polarity? What's the nature and function of a conductor? And why do electric circuits generally have to be insulated? And how are they insulated within the universe? Uh, if you don't mind, Paul, I should say a bit more about uh, the uh, introductory. Oh, please. I thought you were done. I didn't no. mean to cut you off. I, <laughs> I, I, I'd love to hear it myself. Sorry. At least okay. you know where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite okay. You know, interrupt any time. No, um, sorry. Okay. The first thing to understand about uh, nature is that it's not being purposely difficult to understand, and yet we're given the impression that you have to be a high-flying mathematician to even begin to understand the universe. It is actually those people today who complicate things to extremes, where they invent magical stuff and new forces to keep the mathematicians happy. In their hands, physics has become an art contest on chalkboards at a surrealist exhibition. In fact, it was Salvador Dali who was inspired by Einstein to paint his warped clocks in weird landscapes. And certainly modern science comes up with some weird ideas. In my view, the 20th century will be regarded as a failure, setting science back by more than a century. That's a pretty big statement, but I think it will be... Uh, Born out. The electric universe returns to the most fruitful century for the study of electricity, the 1800s, where the great experimental physicists of that era, Ampere, Gauss, Weber, Faraday, were producing the laws of electromagnetism. They came so close to finding the true electrical nature of the universe in the 1850s, would you believe? Yes. The electric universe does what they did, stick to the principles of physics and look for simplifying models. This means in the case of those uh, scientists back in the 1800s, they were convinced that gravity and the cometary displays that we see in the sky are both electrical in nature. And this is the view of the electric universe today. The result of all of this is that uh, the electric universe proposes there is only one force, a universal force, and that is simply the electric force between all matter in the universe. Having said that, it's then possible to show that these other so-called different forces, magnetism, gravity, and nuclear forces, are all manifestations of that one force, the electric force. And the reason that those forces are regarded as different is simply the way that matter responds to this very powerful force. The other aspect of the electric force is that the universe is connected in real time, which returns us to Newton's view of the universe, uh, where gravity doesn't... In, uh, actually refer to time at all. It's instantaneous. 
and that's essential to keep the planets in their regular orbits and, as it turns out, for conscious life, the mind-body connection. Uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake's morphic field, the natural therapy, subtle energy. And then we come to plasma cosmology. Would you believe there is an entirely separate cosmology which has been developed by the electrical experts, uh, which is totally ignored by modern cosmologists because they're too busy scribbling mathematical uh, equations on blackboards. And plasma cosmology shows that the magnificent spiral galaxies obviously don't obey gravity because they're driven electromagnetically. We're actually using the wrong model. Once you understand that, it's easy to explain all of the various features of galaxies, including the fact that they don't need a black hole in the center. Electricity is so powerful that you can concentrate energy in a very small space, and because energy and mass are in some ways equivalent, it appears as if there's millions or billions of stars in a very tiny space when it's actually an electromagnetic phenomenon. The plasma cosmologists go further and say that star formation is also an electrical event, electromagnetic, like lightning in a plasma cloud in space. The, my version, the electric universe, says that planet formation also occurs at the same time and has produced all of those weird exoplanetary systems which puzzle scientists who say, hang on a minute, they don't look anything like our system. The Electric Universe expected and explains that. And then to top it all off, I've gone further than both Newton and Einstein and shown that an electrical theory of gravity actually works. And it shows that uh, the stories that the ancients were trying to tell us about the planetary gods and their thunderbolt weapon were actually correct and that the electricity does play a role even in our solar system when things are going somewhat haywire. So all of that gives you a very quick <laughs> uh, overview of the electric universe model compared to the present one. Excellent. And that brought up a couple of questions for me. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you define subtle energy? Ah, subtle energy is the same kind of energy which uh, controls the planets in their orbits. In other words, it's like gravity. Only around a living organism, uh, it forms a kind of a, um, uh, what would you call it, an aura, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's actually composed of matter, but it's the same matter that forms the substrate of the entire universe, the old ether which the scientists in the 1800s regarded as essential, mm -hmm. uh, but was thrown away by the mathematicians after Einstein. When you reinstate what the great scientists of the 1800s were doing, all of this becomes clear and it's simple. And in fact, the mathematics is that of high school rather than universities, uh, which gives you some idea that I think it's a good test of whether a theory is better than another. But the, the subtle energy, in fact, is the our connection with the consciousness of the universe, but I'll talk about that later. Okay, great. Now, if I'm hearing you right, um, so the ether is the medium in which the aura is carried. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And therefore... It's the subtle electrical currents that are basically creating a level of illumination like a light hitting a lampshade, and the lampshade would be the ether? It's more subtle than that. Electric currents is actually the movement of charged particles, but uh, we, for instance, are not uh, naturally charged bodies. We don't have an excess of electrons over protons in our bodies. Uh, the subtle energy works like gravity, which works between neutral bodies. The Earth uh, and the planets are regard regarded as uh, neutral. Of course, whether that's true or not depends on your point of view. But uh, even so, 
it's not electrical interactions which hold the planets in their orbits, for instance. It's gravity, which is a uh, the interaction between neutral bodies. So this ether is actually talking to us in a much more subtle way than uh, electric currents and uh, radio waves. Okay. So when, you know, for example, there's all sorts of measuring devices mm -hmm. that measure subtle energies. Mm -hmm. And from my knowledge, they're measuring what would really be uh, low voltage currents. What, what are you suggesting that we're measuring then when we're measuring subtle energy? I would suggest uh, they're measuring uh, what you might call Tesla's uh, longitudinal signals, uh, which uh, many people have been experimenting with. Uh, he was using signals which are rather like, I can best explain it perhaps, like uh, the difference between signaling somebody else by pulling on a rope and signaling somebody by waving the rope up and down. Now, when you pull the rope, they'll feel that tug almost instantly. That's the subtle energy connection. The radio waves and uh, all the other kinds of uh, waves are like waving that rope up and down. It takes some time for that up and down motion to receive, get to the other end. Of course, okay. a radio, radio wave travels at the speed of light in the medium. Um, so this connection is the same one as the electric force, which is a direct point-to-point -point force between two particles. So all the particles in your body are in touch with all the particles in the rest of the universe through this direct uh, electrical force. And the force is a dipole force like a magnet. So magnets aren't charged bodies, but they'll attract and repel one another. It's that same kind of force uh, is part of the subtle energy. So the movement backwards and forwards of an object in response to a distant object moving backwards and forwards and emitting that uh, uh, subtle force is what you might call subtle energy. It doesn't involve the transfer of electricity. Okay. Now, this brings up a question for me because uh, I've been a practitioner of Tai Chi for 20 years at least, and I've seen many different systems of photography from those analyzing acupuncture meridian flow. Mm. I'm forgetting the Russian scientist's name that developed the BioWell technology. I've got his book, uh, Krok Krokov or Kroktov or something like that. Um, and then uh, you've got curly in photography and a variety of methods, and I've seen many cases where when they look at, for example, people doing Tai Chi and they measure them and then they have them do Tai Chi for X number of months and remeasure them, then their aura expands and the energy in it gets stronger. And Tai Chi masters have been shown to have, you know, significantly larger auras. And we have the entire history of religion and metaphysics showing saints and evolved souls with very significant auras. Hmm. So there seems to be a link which can be measured between what is referred to as chi or life force and the amount of uh, measurable energy in someone's energy fields or subtle energy. What's your take on that? And what do you believe based on your model that chi is? Of course, the aura is, I suppose, your own personal um, connection with the universe. Uh, the body is not isolated from the or its surroundings. This is one of the problems of modern science. We tend to isolate objects right. and, and give them names and then think uh, by naming things we've, uh, we understand it. We don't. Life itself is not understood by biologists, which is a huge problem for them. But we can forgive them because the physicists have messed things up so that uh, they don't understand it either. Their uh, quantum entanglement and uh, non-locality idea simply means that something is connected in real time, which is exactly what I'm saying. Only they yes. can't, can't say that because Einstein said, no, you can't do it. And so uh, it's a dogma which has stopped the biologists in their tracks. Um, 
once you understand this connection, you realize that uh, the ether being made of real matter, real particles, uh, I, I've suggested that they are neutrinos and that we uh, form a kind of an atmosphere of uh, these neutrinos around us and being structured matter, they can contain information in terms of the way the part- subparticles within them their structure can alter based on this subtle energy transfer. So, uh, and various people have done experiments like uh, Dr. Rupert Sheldrake and his yes. morphic field, which shows that there is this enveloping field which governs the uh, development of an embryo. And mm-hmm. so in curly and photography, you can remove a part of a leaf, but the curly and photograph will show the entire leaf. Right. And people who've had a limb removed have this phantom limb, uh, mm-hmm. which is the same thing. In other yes, words, Rama, Rama Chandran's research has looked into that a lot. Mm, so the, the pattern is there in the ether, in the universe. And I believe this is the way life uh, is generated in the universe by learning in a particular environment uh what kind of life form works best and then that life form will manifest given the chance so we don't yes. develop we don't develop from some primordial soup on the earth uh the life patterns were already available once the earth settled down to a point where life forms could begin to exist and it didn't have to be invented here uh, Fred Hoyle pointed out the chances of random mutations forming a living creature were, um, I think he um, coined the term Googleplex. Uh, yes. It's a one against. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, continuing on that line of thinking, because it's very interesting to me, and I've spent a lot of time studying this because I work in the industry of healing people, mm. and uh I've had a lot of my own experiences through Tai Chi and Qigong and various practices. Yes. And one of the things that you see, even with curly in photography, comparing commercially raised plants to organically raised plants, is that there's a lot more aura radiating off the organic plants that have more vitality. So that would, yes. in, in, in Tai Chi speak, that would mean that the, the plant has more life force or Qi energy. Mm-hmm. So, are do you have a, a concept for how that energy is being uh, produced in the organism that is producing that um, enhancement in chi or life force or subtle energy? Uh, well, there's a feedback mechanism between the organism and the uh, life force, if you like, the rest of the universe, so that when that organism learns how to do something effectively, that information is available not only to its uh, own um, aura, if you like, but to the rest of the universe. And this is something else that Rupert Sheldrake has shown, that you can um, train uh, small animals in a laboratory in one part of the world, and once you reach a certain critical number of them who've learnt this trick, uh, you'll find that it's easier to do in other laboratories. He's also shown that crystalline forms of new uh, developed uh, chemicals uh, w- uh, form more easily once it's been done in one laboratory. And also the newly formed crystals of that material over time settle down so that they can put the standard melting points and boiling points and so on uh, in the standards books. Before that, it's it's varying. It's, it's as if it's learning where its uh, place is in the universe. <laughs> yes, yes. As, the, as they do the – as they form the crystals more and more, they become more efficient at forming. Yes, and I think when that happens, the signal is stronger uh, the more times it's repeated. Uh, and so I think this is uh, behind that kind of effect you're talking about. So if we tie that in with Jerry Tennant's research and his statement that there's a certain level of vitality, I can't remember exactly, it's like minus 25 volts the cell has to be at, and if it drops below that, then disease starts to manifest due to a mm. lack of energy. 
Mm. Uh, and then you look at the fact that people that don't have a healthy diet and lifestyle are going, they do show less subtle energy. And as a healer, I can feel that and I can actually read it and find exactly where they're at the same way Eileen Day McCusick can do it with a tuning fork, Yes, except you, you don't necessarily have to have a tuning fork if you're, if you are the tuning fork. Um, yes. so what this is suggesting is that how one manages their diet and lifestyle has an effect on their biochemistry, which has an effect on the, shall we say, the uh, total charge or capacity within the system, which then turns out to influence subtle energy and vitality. Does that fit your model? Yes, it does. <clears throat> uh, Jerry Tennant's work is looking at the kind of measurable electrical effects in the body. And that's important, of course, but it's only one aspect that, as you say, uh, there seems to be a tie-up between the subtle energy levels and the electrical levels in the body. And of course, a, uh, an organically grown organism will uh, function much better than one that's being fed artificial, uh, artificially uh, fertilized, for instance. Simply yes. because plants themselves, uh, when you look at the work of the uh, great professor, the Frenchman, Louis Kervran, uh, he showed conclusively that plants are able to produce the elements they need. And this is why crop, ro crop rotation is so important in um, uh, organic farming because yes. one crop will produce the elements uh, that another one needs so that when you uh, plant the following year, the plants that have, uh, need the element that the one in the prior crop produced and you've sort of ploughed the, uh, the stubble or whatever it is back into the ground, they will function much, more be much better than they uh, would otherwise if you had to just put chemicals in the soil. Yes, and this goes back to... Uh, an aspect of soil science I'll bring in here since we're on the topic. So I've studied organic farming and soil science quite extensively. And one of the, uh, the some of the great farmers, be it uh, Fred, Fred Sykes from England or, um, God, I'm brain farting. Uh, I'll think of his name, uh, Sir, Sir Albert Howard, who wrote the book, An Agricultural Testament. Mm -hmm. um, they they all said that the weeds are the farmer's report card and weed science shows there's two classes of leaves, uh, weeds, narrow leaf and broad leaf, and each of them grows in the soil because they contain the minerals that's missing in the soil. Mm. So so the the farmer can read the weeds if they're smart and know what elements are missing in the soil what minerals for example and then balance the soils which then stops the weeds from growing because the because nature's not trying to correct itself but the point i'm driving at is the chemical model of farming says let's just poison the little buggers and get rid of them yes. and so they kill they kill nature's feedback system and yes. this is why in f in organic farming, they have what's called green manuring. So red clover, for example, is a common one. You grow the clover, then you plow it into the soil and let it decompose to remineralize the soils, which then basically balances the uh, relationships like diamagnetic and paramagnetic minerals, which then produces a greater flow of electrical energy in the soil, which makes the plants grow better. Yes. So... Where I'm going with all this, if you take what we just talked about with the soil, and instead of talking about soil, you talk about human bodies, when people are eating junk food and not taking care of their bodies and dehydrating themselves, that creates a, shall we say, a decrease in the electrical potential of the body, which correlates to decreased subtle energy. Mm. In, in Chinese medicine or Taoism, you have two kinds of qi, innate and acquired innate yes. is what you're given through your gene line and acquired is comes by way of food, hydration, exercise, breathing, sleeping. Um, so nutrition, hydration, sleep, 
breathing, thinking, and movement are all sources of uh, acquired chi. Yes. So really, uh, what I'm driving at is it seems as that if we don't manage our bodies first and foremost, then we're going to decrease our connection to the natural flow of universe and environmental energies. Does oh, that yeah. sit correct? Yeah, I think uh, the industrial era, the industrial revolution hasn't stopped and we treat everything in a mechanistic way. way. And uh, there are all these dogmas in physics which uh, cripple specialists in other fields and particularly in biology. The idea that uh, you cannot have low energy nuclear transmutations, which were proved by uh, Louis Curvran and others, um, uh, once you've got that dogma in place, you can't see that these are the things that you must do to have a healthy uh, environment for plants and animals. Um, and so you throw chemicals at, at things to try and uh, replace what's uh, you think is needed, but the nature itself is far smarter than the scientists of today. And if you observe closely what's going on in these environments, either in the soil or in the water, in the air, uh, then you are more likely to have a successful result. Instead, of, I mean, <laughs> this is one of the th uh, things about the electric universe model. It applies across uh, so many different fields. And as um, my friends said, this changes everything. And it certainly yes. does. Yeah. Are you familiar with the etheric field of the human body? Well, I suppose that's probably talking about what I was just talking about. In other words, the ether does form uh, a part of a conscious organism. Yes. Well, there's classically two ethers, A-E-T-H-E-R and E-T-H-E-R. One is the cosmic ether that you're talking about. The yes. other one, as Steiner teaches the chloroform it. Chloroform type of stuff. <laughs> well, yes. What, what's, what the etheric field is, the interface between the body itself, the matter of the body, and the subtle energy mm. fields, such as the astral or the emotional field, the mental field, and what would be classically called the causal field which then gets into the higher vibrational energies of the chakras. And, and last time I talked to you briefly about William A. Tiller's research and who'd done the math to calculate all these things. And, and, and these things have also been heavily researched in, and they're very well documented in the book, the subtle Ener subtle, the S encyclopedia of subtle energy anatomy by Cin Cindy Dale, which mm -hmm. is very, very complete and loaded with up-to-date science to back it. And so Steiner described that the etheric field, which is very important because it's actually the interface between the subtle energies and, the, and we call them the more tangible physical energies of the body. Yep. He, Steiner said that energy field is produced by the biochemical interactions within the body. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I, I know you're not a big fan of Nassim Harriman, but he recently said in a lecture I saw that there's 30 billion billion biochemical reactions a second in the human body. Physiology texts say there's uh, around 30 billion biochemical rea reactions in the body, but those books are outdated now. Mm. But what Steiner was basically describing, and Steiner was also an alchemist, he was describing that if the balance of the elements within our body is distorted, then it decreases the vitality of the etheric field and we begin to lose our connection to the information fields like Sheldrake's talking about or any of these subtle energy fields that actually produce the aura and basically was driving the point home that if your diet and lifestyle are not supportive of life, then you start losing connection to the cosmic forces that ultimately are there to keep us uh, informed and alive and vital so that we can live a healthy mm -hmm. natural life like an animal would in its environment you know animals aren't smoking drinking and uh, lighting forest fires to ruin their domain or poisoning themselves with chemicals mm. so um i was just bringing that up because that seems to be the interface between 
Jerry Tennant's model and the subtle energies that we're talking about? Well, I think um, the people you mentioned all suffer from the fact that the science just isn't there to, um, that they can refer to uh, simply because the physicists have lost the plot. You know, they, they don't understand the uh, interactions between uh, particles in the body. Uh, but the, the guy who has done uh, research into this is the cellular biologist Bruce Lipton. Uh huh. I'm familiar and, with his work. Yes. Well, he shows that uh, the in- intelligence, if you like, of a cell is on the cell wall in the form of the receptors and that which mm-hmm. uh, receive signals and then send instructions to the workings, the nucleus and so on of the cell yeah. about yeah. what it wants. And the DNA is like a shop floor where it um, takes the instructions and produces what is required. Yes. Now, uh, Bruce Lipton pointed out that in his research, there are, of course, uh, receptors on the cell wall which respond to uh, signals, chemical signals in the blood, the hormones and things like that, and which can direct yes. the cell to behave in certain ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, but there are also many receptors uh, that don't seem to be listening to what's going on inside the body, but are listening to what's going on in the surroundings in other words the rest of the yeah, the environment yep. yeah so mm-hmm. that's that's the interface in my opinion uh it has to be a subtle uh receiver rather like um you know one of the tesla receivers uh which can pick up these signals from uh the ether the repository of the information uh surrounding us uh so if you are damaging the cells themselves, then these receptors may be damaged or not not able to uh, function properly. And or so, clogged from, from toxicity and chemicals. Yeah, that's the sort of thing. Interference chemically, and this is where the uh, paradigm of medicine fails because it's not really there about health. It's about suppressing symptoms by interfering chemically in such complex uh, interconnected systems that whatever they do, there are unintended consequences uh, simply because they're not dealing with it, the whole system holistically. Uh, so in my opinion, uh, until such time as physics is put in place that can help these people, they've got no, uh, they can't call on a scientific uh, explanation for what they're discovering and this is where the problem comes in because the language they try to use is that of the particle physicists you know quantum theorists and so on and they use words which they don't define would you believe mass and energy are not defined physically in physics, yes that's yes i'm aware of that and that's one of the things nasim harriman brings up a lot yeah, it's incredible. Uh, and yet here they're telling us about um, all of these uh, colossal energy s- systems in the universe when they've got no idea what it is they're talking about. I made it very clear at the beginning that uh, I had to define these things before we could get anywhere. And then the problem for Nassim Haramein and uh, all of these uh, people who are looking for the answers the, to the big questions is that the language they're provided with is largely meaningless. Okay, so this brings up a question for me, because obviously definitions are important or you cannot have context or meaning, correct? Mm, That's right. So when you're talking about morphogenic fields, Mm -hmm. informing genes and informing the development and the learning behaviors, we're actually talking about the transfer of information from a field, the morphic field, to an organism which produces tangible changes in behavior. That's right. All of which indicate mind. Yes. So, so how does one define mind in the electric universe 
uh, theory? Just a moment. Uh, if you look up the definition of mind, it's the element of a person that enables them to be aware of the world and their experiences, to think and to feel the faculty of consciousness and thought. Uh, the thing is, it, it starts out saying the element of a person, but the element is not physically defined, and this is the problem. Uh, as I've said, consciousness is an attribute of the universe, and we seem to have a personal interface with our consciousness through the entire brain and the body. So it's not just the brain that's involved, it's the, the entire body. Um, the brain is obviously uh, designed to... Uh, tune into the certain signals which in, are involved with memory mm -hmm. and uh, also um, logical thinking, you know, being able to figure out, you know, one on one is two. Uh, but the entire body to function does so autonomously. You know, we don't have to think about how we're, <laughs> how the, what the cells are doing at any given instant. That would be impossible. And mm -hmm. once again, this consciousness uh, operates through this uh, instantaneous signaling of subtle energy, which means that uh, like molecules in the, the entire body are in touch with each other in real time. There's no uh, nerve signal delay. Uh, the brain and the organs in the body uh, all can all tune in and know what's happening in other parts of the body. And this is where you, you get your um, meridians, you know, the acupuncture mm -hmm. meridians and the chakras and that. You can understand that the body is organized in a way to transfer information throughout. And so you get these weird connections between different parts of the body. You know, in acupuncture, you can um, have something wrong in your gut and you'll get a needle in your uh, ankle or ear. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, exactly. Or tongue. <laughs> yes. <laughs> or the uh, or your upper uh, eye. Or yes, I, I've studied acupuncture a lot and I'm actually licensed to give uh, dry needle therapies mm -hmm. uh, as long as I have a medical doctor's prescription and I've done thousands of cases. But uh, there's a couple of other things here since we're working on definitions. Mm. When I asked you for the definition of mind, you used two words that are not very well defined because nobody's really sure what consciousness is and no one has ever really given a very solid definition for what thought is. Yes, so that's right. in the in the electric universe model, uh, what is consciousness and what is thought? Well, consciousness is necessary to have the universe to begin with. So it's a fundamental aspect of the universe. Um, and um, I would say that uh, the way to look at it is that, um, how should I put it? It is intention that is the mother of manifestation, of creation, you know, creating something. And mm -hmm. the intention uh, must come from the consciousness which exists before, for instance, a creature uh, is born or yes. uh, conceived. Uh, so mm -hmm. it gives the impression that, um, uh, you know, we come not as blank slates, but uh, incarnate consciously. Right. Well, there's a, a heck of a lot of evidence for this. I sure, mean, I've people, studied a lot of, I'm with you, I, I'm, I'm totally there. I, it still leaves the big question mark of what consciousness is, what you're sort of describing the function of consciousness. That's right. Well, the consciousness itself has to be uh, a repository of information which is organized in some fashion. Um, and also, it must be able to associate uh, different ideas, if you like, different bits of information. Now, the brain seems to be involved in that, uh, and the results, I think, are saved not in your memory, but as Rupert Sheldrake has pointed out, the memory appears to be uh, beyond the body. In the field. It's not, yeah. 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 In the so morphic field or in, in a field, yeah. That's and right. And so, yeah. Um, 
Go ahead if you have more. Well, this is the thing. As far as I'm concerned, the Electric Universe model answers some very deep questions in ways which can give uh, birth to whole new areas of study and right. break break down the the important thing is to break down the barriers of specialties because specialism is a terrible medieval type uh, guild arrangement where you set up barriers to entry and then once you've established yourself it's all a power struggle uh, yes. and you re- repel all borders so somebody who comes up with a brilliant idea that shows these guys are wrong is repelled This is why it's so hard to get any advances in science right now. There are lots of very smart people around who've got excellent ideas but who cannot get published because peer review is a form of um, uh, anonymous censorship. Yes, it is, yeah. By those who hold the keys to the gate of uh, these uh, libraries. Of their dogma. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's... (laughs) We, we we are very poor at doing science and better at making up stories to cover our asses, if you like. <laughs> yeah. A, a couple of questions are arising here. Um, you know, Bentov described consciousness as the total flow of information in any system, mm. which is a, a, a way of looking at it. And it almost fits what you're saying. If you're talking about the universe, then consciousness would be the total information flow in the universe, which would be, you know, yes. <laughs> to quote your Wheeler quote, Google massive. <laughs> yeah, that's right, a Googleplex. <laughs> yeah, it'd be a Googleplex. And, and uh, some of the scientists I've read have basically said that, um, you know, the amount of information in the universe is is like inconceivably large but well, we uh, don't know the extent of the universe so uh, you know that's inconceivably right. large too y- y- yes and, and so then we we have this interesting word thought because when people are measuring electrical activity of the brain or the changes in the brain with functional mris mm. they often make the distinction that they're actually measuring thought but they're not they're measuring the response of a physical organism to thought that's right. And thought can't be thought without consciousness or you wouldn't know you were thinking. So thought seems yes. to be directly related to consciousness and thoughts are flows of information, which obviously have energy. There would be no change in the cells of a brain or a body. And we know from uh, psychosomatic studies, we know from psychoneuroimmunology and from just being an observant therapist that when people have uh, negative thinking or depressive thoughts or self-defeating thoughts or a poor self-image, that it also decreases the life force in their body. And that too creates obstructions to the flow of energy and also diminishes their aura and is correlated with disease. So wh- where do you feel that thought fits into the electrical universe? Well, <clears throat> I actually wrote a few notes about uh, consciousness uh, to begin with. And uh, present science seeks uh, the connection between neurons uh, in the brain as the origin of consciousness. But it's like tracing the circuitry of a computer. It won't necessarily uh, tell you how the thing is programmed. No. Uh, Once again, it's a hangover of the Industrial Revolution mechanistic way of looking at a problem. Uh, what's missing is the electrical connection of all things in real time. And as I said, Einstein's speed limit of light is the roadblock to advancement there. Yes. Uh, and that, uh, as I said, our bodies are connected at a more subtle energy level than light to what we're observing at the instant it is happening. I've often used the analogy of a um, a, uh, a top tennis player returning one of those uh, massive serves uh, if they had to rely on uh, the light signal and the transfer of information via nerves to respond, they'd be standing there with the racket h- held high in the air when the ball's long gone. Uh, yes. The tennis player reacts as if they are a part of a system which involves the ball, their racket, and their behavior all at the same time instantly. And that is... Uh, you know, th- th- this is sort of plain before your eyes, and yet uh, here we are. We're told how the nerves carry the signals, and 
uh, our thought is uh, carried by the nerves and so on. I would say that the thought is also a part of this universal consciousness that it, it taps into, taps into, and uses it as well. Because in yes. some ways, uh, when I said earlier that uh, you you're not born as a blank slate, we come pre-programmed. Well, where is that program? Where is where is the thought, the intention that you came with? Uh, it <laughs> this is a this opens up a whole um, Pandora's box of uh, ways of looking at things and uh, the possibilities, and I think it also uh, opens up the idea that we should look at children when they're growing up and look at what their interests are closely because those interests yes. are often intuitive. I mean, you've seen these people who have been successful in life and they say, when I was four years old, I just wanted to do so-and-so. I wanted to be a dancer. I wanted to be a singer. I wanted to be something. And uh, you've got to ask yourself, well, where did that come from? Uh, and the fact that they're very successful ob obviously means that they seem to have been born to do just exactly what they ended up doing. You know, that's that's the origin of true hap happiness is to actually yes. feel that you've come to the planet, you've made a difference in other people's lives, and you've achieved what you came for. Yes, the, the, the you know the the spiritual or metaphysical or religious word for what contains the information that we bring into a new existence is soul, mm. and and so you know there's there's a myriad of concepts on the soul out there because I've got over 120 books on it which I've studied thoroughly because I find it very interesting that there's almost no agreement on what the soul is. But I won't railroad us yes. because if I get into that, we'll we'll go into a long, deep discussion, uh, which sometime I think you might find interesting because I I've uh, I can explain it in, in some unique ways that I think might fit your model. But uh, a couple of things that I wanted to uh, talk about: Are you familiar with Doctor Daniel Siegel uh, at all? No, I'm not. He's quite a famous. He's a very famous psychiatrist, and, and he's written many books and, and, and um, is quite well known at this point. And he, and he makes the point that as a psychiatrist, he went to conference after conference where doctors and therapists were talking about the mind, but nobody had a definition for the mind that was actually mm. functional or even realistic. So he got mm. a team of 40 of the most intelligent people he could get together, and they worked like a think tank. And they developed a definition of mind I'd like to share with you because I actually think it's sure. quite good. Mm -hmm. Mind is an embodied process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Yeah, you could say we are the manifestation of mind. I was looking uh, at uh, the great psychologist Carl Jung. Yes. And his, his amazing studies, uh, he said, we are not of yesterday or today. We are of an immense age. Uh, he found that the same odd archetypes of memory appeared in people, regardless of uh, ethnicity, where they came from. Uh, yes. And he said that it is, seems we have these memories of things that happened way beyond pre you know, prehistory. And this is the very same thing that. Uh, Velikovsky, I think, uh, felt that uh, we are still subject to things that happened way in the past um, that uh, frighten us today. And one of the reasons why existential fear is such a big driver for our insane behavior. It's also, I think, very important to recognize that both Carl Jung said that humanity is its own worst enemy. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and and I would suggest precisely because we live without any real context or history for our existence. We're just you know, told fairy stories about our existence. Once upon a time, long, long ago, when anything might have happened, uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so we have no understanding why we are here or the meaning of life, which is a very dismal state. And our present cosmology is pretty dismal too because everything finally fizzles out, goes dark. 
<laughs> so um, uh, Carl Jung identified uh, instinctive primal memories of our lost ages, our archetypal memory. And then Belikovsky went on to provide the key to those archetypes in the battles of the planetary gods in our creation myths. He also recognized humanity's doomsday fear and said that we have a great danger lurking in the subconscious that wishes to revisit the apocalypse. And this has fundamental and urgent significance for our insane destructive behavior towards each other and the planet. And it also explains our repeated cycle of wars and the following catharsis. It's the same kind of uh, behavior of somebody who suffered a colossal trauma in their life but can't face it, but somehow their subconscious is keeps niggling reenacting them, it, keeps niggling them the whole time. Yeah. So yes, I, I think uh, as you're saying, uh, the mind is uh, eternal, if you like. Uh, and we are a, a physical manifestation of that mind. Yes, and uh, I think it was James Jeans that said at he, something along the, I'm paraphrasing, at this point I have concluded that the universe is more like a great thought than a great machine. Well, yes, that's a good way of saying it. Hi, everybody. I imagine some of you are finding that your mind is not as sharp as it was, or that you can't seem to remember things as well, such as the last page you read in the book, or the key points from a meeting you just attended recently. Do you feel that your brain is taking longer to come online, or that your thinking gets muddled or fuzzy when you've got a lot to get done? If so, Organifi Pure may be just the magic you need. A key ingredient in Organifi Pure, called Neurofactor, showed a significant impact on brain-derived neurotropic factor, which has been widely reported to play a critical role in neuronal development, maintenance, repair, and protection against neurodegeneration. The certified organic combination of herbs in Organifi Pure not only enhances mental clarity and promotes brain-derived neurotropic factor to stimulate the development of new neural pathways, it aids in enhanced digestion, which is important because many cognitive problems are symptoms of poor digestion. To get your Organifi Pure and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and save 20% on any of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K20, that's CHECK20, during discount. Enjoy. Hi, everybody. I've looked into magnesium supplements in my many years as a therapist and found, unfortunately, most of them are junk until the day Wade Lightheart handed me his magnesium breakthrough from Bioptimizers, which is a very, very specialized product that they did a lot of research on. Wade, I'd love it if you could tell us a little bit about what makes magnesium breakthrough so unique and so potent. Well, number one is that we realized that Different types of magnesium are absorbed by different parts of the body. So we tested virtually every magnesium product there was on the market, and it came down to seven different ones that produced the best aspects or best effects over the broadest amount of people. We combined them without any weird excipients or you know, some of the chemical agents that other companies use. We don't use any of that stuff. And we combined it with humic and fulvic acid as well as B6 to make sure that it's absorbed and utilized by the body. That's excellent. I really love it because one of the things I love about all your products is I can actually turn people on to them. They buy them. And I've never had a single person say to me, those products don't work. Everybody that I know has continued to buy by Optimizer's products to enhance their life. Where can people get it? And what's their discount? Just go to www.magbreakthrough.com slash living 40 and put in your coupon code Paul 10 and you get a 10% discount, and of course, everything has a 100% money-back guarantee. You can't get better than that. Enjoy. Did you know that symbiotica means harmony? And you're really likely to enjoy my podcast with Shervin Jaffaria, the founder of Symbiotica. Symbiotica is an amazing company that makes excellent products to aid healing, enhance longevity, and improve performance at all levels of your being, from your spiritual practices to your athletic endeavors. I highly recommend you go to Symbiotica.com and check out their top-notch organically sourced products that include excellent tasting supplements like their Synergy Vitamin B12, which elevates energy naturally, to their Shilajay Minerals, which help you better regulate your hormonal system. 
Their biocharge activated coconut charcoal is an excellent detox support and removes toxins and poisons from the body quickly and non-invasively. Their organic longevity formula is one of my friends and students' favorites. They rave about it. I really enjoy their Regenesis liposomal glutathione for its amazing antioxidant powers, which is really helpful for anyone that enjoys vaporizing tobacco and herbs like I do. They also have great immune support products, water filtration options for drinking and showering, and some cool clothing and more. When you go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A dot com and use your Living 4D discount code, which is capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 on checkout, you get 15% off anything they sell and you won't be disappointed. Enjoy Symbiotica. Well, Walt, th- these are great explorations. Thank you for entertaining my questions. I really appreciate that. Uh, you said something earlier that I wanted to loop back to. You were talking about gravity, and you were mentioning that the concepts of gravity don't really account for what we see in the universe. And what I'd like to ask is, you know, I've seen several documentaries now where physicists have created levitation machines. And um, so in your model, being that in an electric circuit, there's a north and a south, and and that from what I remember from our first discussion, gravity is related to the electric charge in the universe. Is levity then something equivalent to a North on North or a South on South relation, excuse me, relationship in a magnetic field or uh, how are you, how do you in your model account for uh, the differences in what you're seeing in the, so in, in the galaxies, for example, where, where you're saying what I'm hearing, I might be wrong, that gravity mm-hmm. doesn't account for it. There must be some sort of a levitational force. Well, in the case of galaxies, uh, the plasma cosmologists have shown by both experiment and theory that um, the formation of those spiral arms and the motion of the stars uh, – rotating like a solid disk instead of um, uh, as the planets do in our solar system under the force of gravity, the inner ones move fast around the central object and the outer ones move much more slowly. In the spiral galaxies, the outer stars move much too fast to be held in orbits about the center uh, by gravity. And so they've had to invent... uh, extra mat, you know, <laughs> invisible yeah, matter. Yeah, that's right. Invisible matter just placed where it's needed to uh, save the uh, theory. And this is typical, uh, you know, when the mathematicians uh, find that their maths doesn't work, they just go back. They don't wipe the board clean and think, you know, hang on a minute, have we got the right model? They, they add embellishments to the, what was already there, and so it goes on. Uh, we're, we're at the point now where there's so many barnacles on their models that they're in, in danger of sinking. But um, uh, so the, the plasma cosmology is already uh, well established amongst electrical engineering types um, and those working in high energy plasma labs. Um, And uh, I've got uh, the textbook on the subject, really, uh, Anthony Peratt's Physics of the Plasma Universe, which is uh, quite a brilliant, uh, detailed work. But uh, I've been to the conferences uh, by the IEEE, the largest professional organization in the world, and the only astronomer there was a radio astronomer, uh, Gerrit Vashur. And he was interested in the work of Tony Peratt because he could see that the signals he was getting back from radio telescopes matched Tony's detailed model and uh, at present to astronomers are a bit of a puzzle. So this gives you an idea that um, at the very heart of our cosmology, we've, we started out on the wrong foot and we haven't looked back. And instead of that, we've gone further and deeper into the thicket <laughs> uh, off the main track that was established uh, earlier back in the um, 1800s. Anyway, 
Yes, uh, you were asking the question about um, whether the levitation was like the magnetic north-north and or south-south repulsion. The answer to that question is that uh, that's, as I said, the way gravity works, but uh, most of the levitation experiments I've seen involve trying to balance an electric force or electromagnetic force against the force of gravity, which is uh, a different thing. It's trying to uh, use um, uh, a technique which doesn't involve gravity completely. In other words, one side's electromagnetic, the other side is gravitational. Uh, the Electric Universe says that uh, it should be possible to do it using gravity itself to repel another object. Uh, it's difficult, and obviously it must have been because so many people have tried so many different ways. But the simplest example is that of a, a frisbee or a, a gyro. Uh, anything that's spinning rapidly uh, will produce an offset of the heavier positive charges, that is the protons, which are 2, 000, almost 2,000 times heavier than the lighter electrons, which are the unit of negative charge. So if you spin something, the heavy positive charged particles, the protons, will tend to move strongly towards the periphery of that spinning object. So, and that means that they are separated from the negative charges by a small degree, which produces what is known as an electric dipole. Now, both magnetism and gravity are electric dipole forces, which is the kind of electric force you can have from neutral matter, which produces a measurable force. I mean, anyone who's tried to push uh, two powerful magnets together with the same pole facing each other will understand that this force is considerable. Powerful, yes. Yeah, in the case of gravity, it's very much weaker simply because what we're talking about here is the particles inside a proton and electron. And this this is important. It's not the actual proton and the electron uh, being shoved aside slightly. That's the start of it. What that means is that every atom has its heavy positive nucleus offset from the center, which turns each atom into a slight uh, football shape with mm -hmm. the football, uh, the pointy end of the football, if you like, pointing radially outwards from the center of the spinning. Uh, that means that the interior of each atom then has an electric field in it, and that electric field inside the atom is quite strong, but, and it has an effect on every proton and electron in the atom. And the electric universe model ha has structured particles, not the rubbish that we're taught by quantum theory with quarks and other impossible particles inside them. They are structured just like the atom. So each proton and electron is like a tiny atom, and it suffers a slight offset of the particles just in the same way. And because they're charged particles, uh, it means that this force is daisy-chained between them, even though they're of opposite charge. And they all add up so that by the time they reach the outer edge of this object, it is an appreciable force acting outwards, and it's equivalent to the gravitational force. So uh, this is the same thing that causes people who live in, on the equator to feel less gravity than those who are closer to the poles, simply because the radial acceleration of them around the Earth is sufficient to offset gravity to some degree. In the case of a frisbee and a gyro, the force of gravity is pointing down towards the center of the Earth, but the force from the rest of the universe that's pushing inwards on the Earth is coming from all directions. And this means that uh, the uh, attachment of the object that's spinning, the outer edge is actually attractive towards the rest of the universe. It's also attractive to the Earth, but the, there's a difference in the 
configuration of those two forces, which means that the object will tend to lift. Now, this is why they spin rockets uh, uh, or projectiles to maintain uh, a um, a higher tra trajectory because they offset gravity to some extent. It's why a frisbee will uh, is so effective, particularly the ones that are just a ring rather than a complete object, because the centrifugal force is strongest at the perimeter of an object. So if you have a massive ring spinning, it will tend to maintain altitude and go much further than one uh, which is a, c a complete disc. All of these mm -hmm. things are showing anti-gravity effects. There's the other famous one shown by Professor Eric Lathwaite at a Royal Society lecture in London some years ago, one of the famous uh, Faraday lectures which were normally broadcast by the BBC. And in that, Eric Lathwaite showed the strange behaviour, anti-gravity behaviour of gyros, which is quite obvious uh, to the audience. But the scientists had no explanation for it. So what did they do? They didn't show the, that uh, BBC program that year. But it no, is now great. It, but it is now available on the web uh, if you look it up, uh, Eric Lathwaite. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is typical. Uh, there is, there are at any time in the on the Earth, a small handful of people who are real scientists, those who are prepared to go wherever the evidence leads them. And then there are the others, the journeymen, the ones who have been trained as technologists rather than scientists, uh, who don't know how to ask questions or don't know how to phrase them in such a way that they might even begin to find an answer. And that's what we do in our universities and our education systems, unfortunately. We train technologists, and you can see that every day from these experts who give opinions on things, which is totally unrelated to anything else, you know. Um, so an expert in one uh, field is misled by an expert in another field, and the whole thing becomes a… Uh, Chinese whispers. Chinese whispers, that's right, and the results are nonsense. <laughs> yeah. It's very, sad, it's very sad to watch with this pandemic because that's exactly what we're seeing uh, totally. This, totally, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. you're getting it worse in Australia than we are here, which is hard to even believe. Oh, actually, we're doing quite well, strangely enough. <laughs> it's, oh, well. It's a bit, bit easier to close your borders when you've got the Pacific Ocean and that, uh, and the Indian well, Ocean. Well, no, I, I, just, I just meant with all the lockdowns and vaccination, oh, yes. you know, enforcements, it's like uh, you guys are – you know, I'm, I'm right. for, for as progressive a country as Australia is to see how non-progressive they are in their medical approaches is a bit shocking for me. Well, uh, the medical profession is very strongly controlled by the snake oil salesmen of today. Uh, <laughs> they've had a field day because they're only interested in what technology sells and exactly. not, about, not about health at all. And that's or truth. typical of snake oil salesmen. <laughs> You know, um, if I could loop back a touch, I found your interesting, your description of the uh, nucleus of the atom, if I got you right, was shaped more like a football and less round. Was I correct on that? Yes. Uh, when it's distorted uh, the uh, and the uh, nucleus is offset from the center, the whole thing, the whole atom, uh, the orbits of the electrons change to an ellipsoid because the uh, proton or the nucleus then is at one of the focuses. It can't be at both. And uh, in the case of the Earth, for instance, all of the atoms uh, in the Earth are offset to some extent with their positive nucleus offset towards the surface. And I should say, and this is the important thing, the same applies to the moon, to the sun, to the other planets, and so on, which means that they are all repelling one another because it's the same pole facing outwards. All of the planets in that behave like the same pole of uh, a magnet. And this is totally at odds with the belief, and it's only a belief, that gravity is always attractive. 
And this is important. And it's important because there was a, an amazing real scientist, the astronomer uh, Dr. Halton Arp, who uh, showed observationally that the universe is not expanding, that it's more or less static. And he said, this is a problem unless gravity is a repulsive force. And uh, I've met Dr. Arp, uh, had lunch with him in London, and we've spoken at the time when um, I met him. Unfortunately, I hadn't fully formed my model of gravity. It was kind of half formed, if you like. And uh, he missed my presentation. I saw his. Uh, we arranged for him to speak at uh, one of the universities in London. And uh, so he didn't hear me. He had to go off to, uh, for an interview with um, uh, Fred Hoyle, which turned out in uh, a very important video series called The Cosmology Quest, which can also be Ooh. found on U YouTube. Well, I want to see that because I love Fred Hoyle, the cosmology quest. Yes. So I, I spoke to uh, Halton Arp shortly before he did uh, uh, the film. The guy who was making the, uh, the video uh, was actually at that lunch too. So it was an un just unfortunate timing that I wasn't uh, quite in a position to feel I could convince him that this was the answer, but he was pursuing uh, people in the past, including Newton himself, who recognized that a repulsive gravity equation would work, uh, provided there was some force acting inwards on the solar system. But uh, neither he nor anyone who followed was able to think how that might work uh, because it involved particles colliding with uh, other particles in each planetary body. And of course, collisions cause heating, and they, they figured out that the uh, heating cause would vaporize the planets, and obviously that's not the case. So, right. <laughs> but my um, model answers that question by using the very force of gravity itself and recognizing it as a dipole force, not as a monopole force uh, in the old uh, way of thinking. That's interesting. Are you at a point where I can ask a question? Sure. I think that's fascinating. Now, the reason I asked you to, to recap the uh, concept of the neutron being shaped like a football is because, and you and being slightly off centered, wouldn't that? Well, like you said, the planets do do not move in perfect circles; they move in ellipses. But wouldn't that also produce an atom that spins, and instead of spinning? <clears throat> off a central axis like a top, wouldn't it be actually creating a pattern more like a spiral as it spins through space? Uh, when I was speaking of the Earth, uh, <clears throat> all of those atoms are held in place. They're parts of structures, parts of crystals, minerals, and so on. Uh, and we are a part of the Earth. Our, our little dipoles line up with those of the Earth, and which causes us to be attracted to it. Of course, the question is, okay, uh, if gravity is a repulsive force, how do you form a planet or a star in the first place? Well, the plasma cosmologist showed that the electromagnetic force, which is far more powerful than gravity, uh, does it the job for us. And so once these objects are formed, the gravity is then a, an intrinsic part of each of those objects, all of the celestial bodies. Uh, but the celestial bodies themselves are first formed in these uh, cosmic lightning bolts in giant molecular clouds in the galaxy. Very interesting. The reason I was asking that is because I was wondering if, if when the neutron is slightly displaced and shaped like a football, are you could talking that, about the atom? Yes. In, in, yeah. Okay. Could. Could that be related to torsion fields? No, there's no necessity to, to introduce anything uh, else. Uh, and very, I must tell you, field theory is uh, doesn't just help explain anything. It's just a description. F fields are descriptions. Uh, the magnetic field, for instance, is a description of the conditions in space uh, surrounding an object. Um, 
and uh, it's equivalent to a weather map, for instance, where the lines represent uh, equal pressures in the atmosphere. So it requires a substrate, an ether. So all these uh, modern field theories which don't have an ether are wasting their time because there's n- they'll never explain it without the ether. The electric universe recognizes the ether and explains the field in terms of actual forces and particles. Okay. Uh, I think maybe you and I are just operating on different definitions of field because I'm quite sure, sure in my science dictionary, it defines a field as a place of action. <laughs> yes, but it doesn't say what is acting. Well, I think if it's an electromagnetic field, then it's electromagnetism. It's if a football field, it's football players. Yeah, that's right. But the electromagnetism is always associated with charged particles. So what are these charged particles doing? That's the question. That's the fundamental question. <laughs> They're creating you and I and everything else by the look of it. <laughs> that's, that's right. Yeah. Uh, this is the thing. Uh Without these critical definitions, modern science, we're just wasting our time playing mathematical games. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to negate you or 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 cat and mouse you. I'm, I'm really asking the questions <laughs> I that I think they need to be asked, or otherwise I fall into the position of just believing you, or believing no, somebody no, no. else. And then you don't yeah. really have education. You've just got brainwashing and a dogma that's not questioned. And That's right. these are very important questions for me because I'm a student of life. I want to know, just like you want to know, I want to know. And the reason I wanted to talk to you is because I suspect you know about a lot more than this than I do. So mm. I, I have to ask these questions because, you know, no, hey, everyone. I, I, I'm, I'm pleased that you do because uh, this is a very important point. Uh, it was Faraday who uh, liked his field theory. Uh, because it sort of described in ways that he could imagine uh, what was going on in his electrical experiments. Uh, but it was the, the great uh, experimental physicists of Europe who did the real work on what, are, what does this mean in terms of the particles that are creating these fields. And uh, it was their work which is more fundamental still uh, and which is, I uh, propose, their work, particularly that of Wilhelm Weber, who produced an electrodynamic law as distinct from the electrostatic law of Coulomb, an electrodynamic law which deals with charged particles in motion. And in fact, uh, the universe is really composed of charged particles in motion. The entire universe is charged particles in motion. And this is why the electric force is paramount. It is uh, singular uh, and all other forces are just responses of the matter in the universe to that force. It's very simple. You know, we'll be able to teach kids in primary school uh, the basics. Hey, this is kind of a a sort of a strange way we're going about it. And it's, it's my fault for because of the, because I'm in charge of directing the flow of all this, but we were going to just at question two just describe what it is that is the characteristics of a negative and a pod- positive polarity and some of those basics. Maybe it's fine if you don't mind just to give a quick sort of uh, dictionary definition of that so that people that uh, hear it can at least put some context to some of the things we're talking about if they don't understand that. Yeah, okay. You've got the question. So the first one is, what are the characteristics of a negative polarity relative to a positive polarity? The difference in polarity of a battery or a power supply is that um, in the case of the negative polarity, there is a surplus of electrons available. And at the positive polarity, there's a deficiency of electrons. So as soon as you connect a circuit to it, the electrons will try to rush from the negative to the positive. Uh, This may seem a little confusing at first because uh, originally the convention was that the uh, current flowed from the positive to the negative terminal. 
But since it's right. the electrons that are able to move, it's actually the electrons that are doing the work. Um, right. Mm. When I was in electronics school, the way they taught us to remember it is something very simple. They said, just remember, positive sucks. <laughs> well, that's a good way of thinking of it, yeah. Yeah. So now I know these are rudimentary questions, but I just want to make sure people can have a little context. What is the nature and function of a conductor? Uh, well, metal conductors have the free outer electrons of the metal atoms. In other words, those electrons uh, easily move from one atom to the next. And uh, they're required to move or migrate through a circuit along the wire from a negative uh, terminal to a positive terminal of a power source, which, as I said, is a bit confusing if you're brought up with the conventional ideas. Um, but it's the movement of electrons, and it's the acceleration of electrons from one atom to the other, which generates the surrounding magnetic field. Now, when I say field, remember, we're talking about the neutrinos. Those neutrinos carry the signal of that movement from one end of the circuit to the other at the speed of light. This is why uh, generally uh, it's thought of that uh, signals in a circuit can tra travel at the speed of light along a copper wire. The electrons themselves move very slowly, however, and uh, even something like running a, a heater or a toaster, the electrons are moving in probably centimetres per hour, to give you some idea. In space, it's different. There, the atoms have electrons stripped from them by ultraviolet light from stars so that both positively charged atoms, the most common one is just the hydrogen nucleus uh, because it's only got one electron. You strip that off and you've just got a positive charged uh, proton. And the negative electrons will move in opposite directions in an electric field. So the uh, electrons moving towards the positive end of the electric field and uh, the positively charged atoms and ions and so on be moving the opposite direction. Their movement, their total movement, forms a current, and that current generates a magnetic field, which causes those positive and negative particles to move in spirals and form a Birkeland current filament. Now, these Birkeland current filaments are named after the famous Norwegian scientist who studied the auroras and found that they were electrical currents coming from the sun. Uh, of course, this wasn't believed until recently when finally um, it was acknowledged that there are <laughs> currents in space. And these Birkeland currents are the space wires, if you like. The auroras are, are examples of Birkeland currents from the sun following magnetic field lines down from space into the upper atmosphere. And you did send, say in the first podcast, if I remember right, that plasma is the conductor for those currents, correct? I should say, yes, that uh, once you've stripped the electrons from atoms, you've formed a plasma. And uh, in Anthony Peratt's Physics of an Electric Universe, um, uh, sorry, of a <laughs> Physics of a Plasma Universe, he mentions that one in 10,000 atoms losing its electrons are sufficient in space to call it a plasma because the electrical force is so powerful that its influence on those ionized atoms overrides that of anything else. And this is why we can talk about galaxies being an electromagnetic phenomenon because they're one giant uh, plasma circuit. It's quite beautiful, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's quite wonderful. But it also shows that um, ideas of like the fractal universe and so on are not correct because you have to be careful about what scale you're talking about. At the scale of the solar system, gravity dominates. At the scale of a galaxy, uh, 
the electromagnetic forces operate at the tiny scale of the atom, the electric force dominates. So you have to be aware of which form of the electric force is dominant at different scales. But when you do that, you can understand the patterns they form. And this is, this is you know, one of the sort of beautiful things you th- look back at and you think, wow, ain't nature marvelous? Uh, simply because you suddenly understand the geometric patterns that are being formed and why they're being formed. Yeah, very interesting. It's, uh, you know, just having studied so much stuff and and spent as much time as I could looking into thunderbolts and electric universe, watching videos, reading books, and putting my own mind to it. it it's it's really like we're still really um, infants in the school of universal knowledge. Oh, yes. I've said that um, it's rather like one of those Arthur C. Clarke stories, um, Childhood's End, where in that book, of course, it's the aliens who help us to achieve uh, breakthroughs uh, to leave our childhood. Well, the electric universe is the touchstone for growing up in the universe and behaving like uh, <laughs> uh, useful citizens of the universe. Let me put it that way. <laughs> yep. Very interesting. In fact, I remember um, it was one of the astronauts on the Apollo missions, was it Anders, I think, who took the photograph of Earth where uh, Earth was rising above the horizon of the moon, the famous Earth rise picture. And he said that on the way back, he couldn't understand why humanity was so divided. Uh, well, Velikovsky provided the answer to that with our doomsday fear. We have this horrible existential fear, which is based on not knowing anything about our place in the universe or or actually the magnificence of what we are. Um, and he said he gave up on religion at that point because he couldn't imagine any God being bothered to look at our petty <laughs> misbehaviors one by one on the earth. And of course, this idea that the gods are actually imminent staring down at us uh, comes from that same era when the planets threatened us with doomsday. Yeah, I have a lot I could say on that, but I'll save that one for another time when we can get into these things. But uh, we bro- we briefly spoke about the energy or the source of potential um, Yes, that's providing the power for the electric universe, the circuitry of the electric universe in part one. And when I asked you what the potential was or the source was, you said that you didn't know, mm. which was, you know, honest. Um, could you speculate as to what potential could be coming from and guesstimate how much energy the, there is in the universe? Yeah, that question is one that's been asked of the plasma cosmologists who've done all the experimentation. And uh, the simple answer is that we can observe what's happening, we can see the current flowing through space. It's That's which forms the so-called um, cosmic web. That web is actually an electrical web. Uh, and it's known from plasma science that uh, regions of different uh, characteristic uh, plasmas uh, moving past one another induce electric currents in each other. But then you've got the chicken and the egg problem of what causes the movement of the plasma. Uh, So all we can do at this stage is to acknowledge that our physics relies on observation. If we don't have observations which can show us a preferred direction for the currents or what the circuitry looks like on a grand scale, uh, we're still at that point where we we at least we have the correct questions to ask about origins, uh, you know, and uh, how did the universe form? But at this stage, we don't have any, enough information to answer any of them. 
but at least it's encouraging to understand what it is, you, your surroundings and uh, how that works. That's the most critical thing without inventing dark matter and dark energy and all the other crazy stuff. Uh, we, we can look at what we can see and we can say, yes, I understand that. Yes. Uh, I think before, if I remember right, you weren't a fan of the zero point field. Uh, is that correct? Yes, as I said before, field theories are mere descriptions of observed space conditions and are not an explanation of anything until you understand what space is. And the zero-point field is a bit of statistical nonsense based on a finite probability of the impossible happening, particles winking in and out of existence in an unmeasurably short time interval. So zero-point energy just doesn't exist. Uh, it's another one of these... Uh, statistical games, which uh, the famous author Douglas Adams in his uh, Hitchhiker's Guide uh, made fun of with his infinite improbability drive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where they pick up somebody who's been tossed out of one spaceship by another one that's uh, traveling on the infinite improbability drive. And I just, yes. I thought that was brilliant because he saw through this game of um, using statistics to try and uh, – um, pretend you're doing physics. Yes. So you see, I added a question there since our last discussion. I'm curious, how does the Kazmaier effect uh, fit into this electric universe model and or potentially um, as a source of expressing the potential that's there? Ah, you'll notice that the Kazmaier effect is a physical force arising from a quantized field. That's the definition. But uh, quantum theory is statistical and has no physics basis, so it has no physical. And also, the Casimir effect is between two uh, metal plates uh, situated extremely close to one another. Right. It has no physical counterpart in space, so the Casimir force is a an electrical effect, in other words, one of these dipole effects between two ponderable sheets of metal. Uh, there's nothing magic about it at all. Okay, so it, it fits the model. It's it not. Fits, uh, it fits the model. Yeah. Yeah. Um. You know, <laughs> my 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 C question here is probably not your favorite kind of question, but although you do seem to have a, uh, a, a yeah. an open head for for exploring things that we've talked about in the last one, which I was pretty impressed that you would go there. But uh, the question is, though science may not be able to measure the total energy nor the potential energy, there are long-held metaphysical conceptions as well as some other theories. What are – I was just wanting to know, you know, since you obviously have stated you don't know what the potential is, mm. what's your – What's your hypothesis, your best guess, or your intuition? Well, uh, the fundamental problem is, as I said, that physics has no definition of energy. So we simply, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore, we don't even know what they're talking about when, when we're talking about total energy. Uh, the electric universe defines it as the energy uh, energy of moving particles, moving charged particles with respect to all other moving charged particles in the universe. So um, <laughs> we, and since uh, according to Halton Arp's work, we don't know the extent of the universe. We don't know what that actually means, but it involves infinities. And when you involve infinity, you're no longer doing mathematics. You're, you're just talking about concepts, concept of uh something unimaginably uh, large or extensive. So uh, it's, it's beyond physics, and so it becomes metaphysics. But that doesn't help, doesn't explain anything. It's, that just becomes stories then. We simply don't know where the energy of the universe comes from, because and physics can only deal with observations, and what we see is a universal network of cosmic circuits but we don't see a wall socket to plug it into. Okay. So here, here I'm going to take you down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things that we know cannot be explained 
but there are yogis and Sufis and others that have done some very strange and interesting things. And I have not only seen documentaries, but I have books documenting this. There is a man, I forgot his name, but he was a breathitarian who could live without food or water. And they brought him into laboratories in India and studied him for, I think, two weeks. And they had him under security cameras and guards and everything to make sure he could not cheat the system. And they analyzed this guy and could not, for the life of them, figure out how he was doing this. So, uh, Walt, to, to continue on that, we've got the breathitarians. And so, f- based on physics and biology, that's impossible to do. But before we get into it and you answer, there are other things. I have seen a documentary where a man went to tremendous effort to go way up. I believe it was maybe the Himalayan mountains. And he had heard about this. I think he, it might've been Tibet, but it was a, it was a monk. And this monk could do all sorts of wild stuff. And one of the things that he showed right on the film, which was pretty mind boggling is this monk built a big fire and put a shovel in it. And when he, Wait, he waited till the shovel was glowing white hot. And when he picked the shovel up, the shovel was so liquid it folded back, like you know how molten metal is, and it was glowing white. And mm. he held that shovel to his tongue for a good 20 or more seconds and took his, then he took it off, showed his tongue it was not burnt, it didn't hurt him at all. And he could do many such things. Yogananda, in his autobiography of a yogi, and I was raised in the Self-Realization Fellowship, spent summer camp with monks, went to temple meetings with them on Sundays, asked them every question I could throw at them, and they were the only people that could answer my questions that I could not get answered anywhere else. And my experience is Yogananda is not someone to mislead people, but in the autobiography of a yogi, he talks about a yogi who got mugged basically if i remember the story right it's been years and a guy cut his arm off with a sword and the mystic picked it up put it back on and it rehealed very quickly like if i remember right in seconds and the guy's arm worked perfectly so a lot of people just write this shit off and say oh it's just a bunch of stories but there's too many people being studied and there's too many eyewitness observations of some of these mystics and high-level yogis doing things. And then there's over a hundred and I think a hundred and sixty. There's a huge number of Tibetan monks that have reached what's called rainbow body. And when they go into this final ceremony where they leave, they go into meditation. And after a period of time, their bodies begin to smolder and turn into ash. And as it's happening, a rainbow type energy is created. And then they're still able to communicate with people that are perceptible enough to talk to them and explain some of these things. But they go through years and years and years of training to to reach what's called the rainbow body. Now, I'm not trying to hold the position that I can't say these things are factual because I've never seen this myself. I've seen what I talked to you about on the documentary. I've, I've actually, I know for sure that there's people out there that can use their own chi and light bags on fire and, and light things on fire with their own life force energy. But this study in India on this breathitarian was hardcore science. And the point I'm getting at is all of these people in every single case say they draw their power to do this from God, from that which creates the universe, that which is behind the universe, and that they all explain that the universe is really, um, well, for lack of a better term, it's the illusion, because ultimately what God is can't even be encapsulated by matter. So this leads back to whatever potential is. So really where I'm trying to go is there's too many of these reports and there's people like this breathitarian that have been studied and they're drawing off a source of energy science cannot define. And Mm. I'm not asking you to be objective. I'm asking what is your intuition? 
What do you feel uh, is the well, best explanation? I think uh, any information should be looked at uh, objectively from this new model because uh, if it's going to be a real cosmology, it must have uh, answers for these questions. If they are, you know, verified, the observations are verified, and the the data is taken, then it has to be observed, uh, actually analysed properly, and not just yes some taboo set up around it so that you can't ask that question. Well, yeah, that's um, why I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, I'm asking you to get rid of the taboo. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, I would say that uh, very early on I said that uh, intention is the mother of uh, manifestation and these are manifestations. So the intention uh, must be uh, something quite unusual, something that uh, we don't experience as a general thing. And this is possible, I think, because when you look at – the great pyramids and things like that, and not just the ones in uh, Egypt, but around the world. And you realize that uh, with the equipment and technology we have today, we couldn't match what they did back then. Not even close. No, you realize that uh, we are very ancient, but things have happened to us and the world which have repeatedly uh, brought us to the brink of extinction, uh, and a lot of information has been lost. But there are those who've kept that information alive in different parts of the world, uh, and the information, when it's looked at objectively by scientists today, is found to have a substance. In other words, there's, there is real uh data and science to support these things. Uh, In the case of uh, the building with huge blocks of stone and so on, there are two aspects to that which I think are not considered by modern science. And one is that in the past, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, uh, both we were here and we experienced a much lighter gravity. The ancients uh, actually knew more than we do today about many aspects of uh, life and uh, about how to build things, how to um, uh, perform medical, as you almost call them miracles today. Right. Uh, How to use the natural world because nature provides everything we need. It's just a case of having the wisdom and wit to find those things, Uh, not to try and... uh, outwit nature because uh, you, you'll never win. Well, it's like trying to, you know, as the old saying goes, a watch can never figure out its maker. <laughs> That's right, yes. Um, so I think in the case of the Breatharian, for instance, the work of um, uh, Louis Curvran showed that biological enzymes are capable of transmuting elements. Now, if that's the case and your intention is focused enough to be able to motivate uh, enzymes to create the things that you need for to continue living without actually consuming anything uh, mm-hmm. apart from certain aspects of yourself, then uh, that maybe could explain that particular uh, experiment that was done with the breatharian. In the other cases... So you're talking about transmutation of elements. Yes, in other words, the things that that person needs to sustain life can be uh, produced by the body by changing the function of the enzyme activity within the body. Uh, That's just the thought that comes to me. But at least when you uh, stop saying, no, no, it can't happen, it's impossible, I should not stop the person who says it is possible from doing it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly. <laughs> How true is that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, 
I'm an example of that with the Sapphire Project. I was told by the expert plasma physicist that uh, what was happening was impossible. <laughs> and I said, right. Well, Very good. Right before your eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's a great quote by Aubrey Hepburn. She says, nothing, uh, the, the, nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh, a good way to uh, drive progress. You know, uh, I want to interject. In my library, I have a lot of extensive research in soil science, and there's some research from 50s, 50s and early 60s, if I remember right. But they did a comprehensive analysis on soil to determine everything that was in it. They weighed mm. it. Mm. Then they planted a tree in it. And they let the tree grow till it was quite big. And interestingly, when they took all the soil out, they took the tree, separated it, and reweighed the soil. It had not lost any weight at all. And when they analyzed the elements that were in the soil, there were many new elements that had been created by the tree that were not there in the beginning. Yes. The conclusion is that somehow that tree is growing without consuming the elements of the soil and is adding elements back into the soil, which goes against, you know, Western scientific logic. Uh, uh, <laughs> scientific taboos. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, that's exactly what uh, living systems can do. They are able to bring uh, two elements together, two atoms of different elements, in such a way that. Um, the so-called Coulomb barrier, which is not a barrier at all, it's a, an electrodynamic barrier, which means that it changes at high frequency. So if you can tune the two atoms, uh, elements to come together at the right time, uh, they actually attract one another and merge and form a new element. Um, this is actually something that happens all the time in uh, electronics. They call it quantum tunneling. Well, remember, right. quantum, fi quantum physics is not physics at all. It's just a st statistics. Uh, so it doesn't explain a damn thing. But if it's an electrodynamic barrier, that uh, barrier that this uh, particle doesn't have enough energy to get over is actually going up and down at a very high frequency. So if you can just time it right, you can actually arrive when the barrier is down and go straight through without, <laughs> without any impediment. I mean, it's so simple when you look at it that way, but uh, the quantum physicists like to make it sound like magic so that they have some exalted position with their mathematics and their crazy models uh, to uh, maintain their status, <laughs> so to speak. I understand what you're saying, but I want to also be fair to the quantum physicists because I've probably studied 200 books on quantum physics, mm. and the range of the range of mindsets, gestalts, and opinions amongst them is as wild as it is in religion. And yes. I think there's plenty of them that are more bent toward your position. They're not all in the class you're talking about. I just want to be fair. Well, the thing is that there are thousands of uh, scientists around the world, so-called dissident scientists, uh, which f fill a very large book. There's a compendium of them uh, done by a Frenchman, Jean Clément, and uh, it runs to hundreds of pages. Now, all of these people, to a man practically, uh, have pointed out the problems with Einstein's work. And it's quite basic. It's very simple. Uh, and it shows and even Einstein himself wrote in a private letter after that was not shown until after he died, uh, that, where he was very uncertain that anything he had done would last. And he had every right to feel that way. Uh, he was thrust into stardom by um, a rather big-headed uh, scientist, uh, Eddington, who also gave us the incorrect model of stars, the standard model of stars as Eddington's. And he got that wrong. He also uh, championed Einstein and made him a, an overnight sensation. And that has stopped physics in its tracks for over 100 years now. 
So uh, <laughs> science is actually very subject to the fads and fashions like anything else, like, you know, applies in almost any uh, human endeavor. And it's and because of the way uh, the system is set up now with big institutions and so on and so much money, government money running on, um, or, you know, based on their so-called expertise, that uh, trying to upset that is like trying to uh, turn the Titanic around. Uh, <laughs> but the icebergs are out there. Yes. We, we, we talked earlier, you mentioned the word mysteries, and, and really myths are attempts to explain mysteries. And I think, you know, like we were talking about earlier, and, and, and one of my questions was, you know, where do you feel we're at with what we know relative to what we don't know? And I suspect your answer was we, there's a lot more we don't know than what we do know. Wouldn't that be a safe assumption on my end? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about um, myths and that, of course, <clears throat> uh, the work that's being done right now is uh, Dave Talbot, my close colleague and uh, co-founder of the Thunderbolts Project, is uh, producing his definitive series, uh, Discourses on an Alien Sky, on the Thunderbolts uh, YouTube channel. Uh, in my work, uh, while working on the definitive Electric Universe book, uh, I'm interested in the question of why is the positive proton nearly 2,000 times more massive than the negative electron, given their origin from ether particles, the neutrinos? So that's an interesting question. Uh, Ido Carl and James Sorensen are working on the structured atom model, which shows that the nucleus of an atom does not contain neutrons, and it doesn't require the strong force. All it requires is the standard electric force. But by placing electrons in the nucleus in a structure between the protons, the overall force is actually attractive, and that's what uh, holds the nucleus together. But uh, interestingly enough, the structures they come up with are very important in determining the behavior of each atom in chemical experiments. It's chemistry. So this is getting down to the real nuts and bolts of chemistry. So that's uh, very interesting work and it's based purely on uh, the electric force between uh, electrons and protons in the nucleus. Uh, another guy, Andrew Hall, has done some remarkable work on the sculpting of planetary surfaces uh, by the so-called thunderbolts of the gods. And the uh, evidence he provides for the production of the amazing landscapes of the southwest of the United States is a very good example. I saw some of those videos that you guys have already put out. They're quite mm. impressive. Oh, yes. And in fact, uh, this is the the thing about the electric universe, in each different subject, major subject, it practically turns the uh, standard view on its head so that it gives uh, inspiration to upcoming students to see all of the possibilities that suddenly open up for them. So if we want to inspire kids to go back to science, stop trying to stuff mathematics down their throat, teach them physics first, and mathematics as a tool, not the reverse. Yes. Uh, and uh, also then stop just teaching facts because the facts that you're teaching, most of them are not correct. Right. Uh, instead, give students alternatives to think about and get them to write their opinions about different theories instead of just telling them which one is right and which uh, genius to worship. Uh, which more or less stops progress right in its tracks. Uh, doing all of that and also putting computers in their place, they're not there to produce virtual reality images to convince people that your crazy story is, is worth pursuing and spending billions of dollars on. 
is which is what's happening with COVID. <laughs> well, it's happening. It's happening in uh, particularly in basic physics with the Large Hadron Collider, the gravity wave telescopes, which are absolute nonsense since they don't understand what gravity is. Uh, I actually asked that question of one of the uh, leading physicists uh, when he was out here visiting Australia. And he accused me of uh, colonial cringe because he was an Englishman. And I thought, well, that's great. (laughs) (laughs) If that's the best you can do, just attack the person who's asked the question. Yeah. Uh, So there's so much waste right now. And with asking the right questions and also relating what the uh, answers, what uh, the significance of the answers are for you as an individual because these yes that's very from, important yeah these questions from the electric universe point of view help us understand our place in the universe and why we're here there can't mm-hmm. be anything much more important than that no yeah it's a, it's a fascinating discussion and that's really why i wanted to to talk to you and and you know because as I said in part one, the more I watched Electric Universe videos and studied the material and read the books, the more I felt, you know, my truth buzzer kept going off. You know, I have an mm. intuitive compass. I have a sense of when something is, uh, you know, it's kind of like if you're lost in the woods and you're looking <laughs> for water and you you are intuitive enough, you'll find it. And so... Mm. If we think of the water as, as a greater truth than what's on the table, I felt like, okay, my my dousing rods are pointing toward the water here and I want to keep going. And then, you know, once yes. I got the podcast going and it was big enough to have a large enough audience that I thought it would be worth your time, I said, okay, now I'm going to go see if I can talk to Walt Thornhill because I want to, you know, keep, see if I can keep tuning my compass in the right direction and share that with as many people as possible, because at the end of the day, if if what our two podcasts together have done is open people's minds to a lot of the stuff they're taught just isn't true, doesn't make sense, is is really uh, propaganda and uh, propaganda for profit and the, uh, attempts to maintain uh, an establishment that's putting money in the hands of the few. And a good example of mm-hmm. that is I was reading... Uh, I was doing some study in cosmology, and I think it might have been Fred Hoyle, actually, that said this. He said that nobody that's studying cosmology with a theory that does not fit Bible, Big Bang, or the Bible cosmology, no one can get a grant unless their research is supportive of the Bible. And he felt that this religious influence on science had held science back, you know, uh, you know, but a huge, huge amount. Yep. And so religion really and, it, Yeah, religion and science never separated. Right. Yeah. And and myth has never left either. And until well, well, you know myth, Yeah, myth's important because that's the memories of the our most ancient memories. What we have to do and what Dave Talbot has done amazingly is to analyze that uh forensically to understand what it is they were trying to tell us. But you have to compare myths from around the world to see what the uh, common elements are to be able to do that. And he's, he and Dwadu Cardona uh, and Ev Cochran have done an amazing job. And I've used their work as the, uh, the ground zero for the physics. Yes, I think too, though, there's many classes of myth. You know, you're talking about creation oh, sure. myths. There, there's, you know, as you know, well, many, many, many are important because they are actually the stories of the change in the Earth's environment at the last yes. catastrophe. And, yeah, I'm uh, speaking. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the thing for me is that uh, the native people of Australia, the Australian Aborigines, their uh, traditions have some of the most accurate memories of what happened and it just matches beautifully what um, uh, our mytho-historians, uh, Dave Talbot and Dwight Cardona and so on, uh, have produced. Yes, it's amazing. And I, I'm speaking more in the sense that a myth is an attempt to explain the unexplainable 
And as we've discussed, there's more we don't yes. know than we do know. So, you know, at some level, no matter how objective the electric universe is or David Talbot or any of these people are, there's still a lot more that we don't know than we do know, which means we're still trying to resolve the grand myth. Mm. And, and therefore, we all can think we're right and feel objective based on what we have on our plate. But when you start finding other factors that make you go, oh my God, now that changes everything, then we have to reevaluate our myth. And that's what history has shown in science is we keep, you know, having to reevaluate, right? It wasn't yeah. long ago people thought the earth was flat. So um yeah. the know, important I just thing think that I, yeah, the, the important thing that I learned was that uh by not assuming myth is fiction, that uh it provided the input I needed to develop the electric universe model. Yes, so you you uh you did a scientific taboo based on the standard model. <laughs> yes. You opened your mind. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you look past the wall of objectivity based on somebody else's viewpoint? Yes, terrible. <laughs> yeah. All right. But it's well, very very exciting for those who uh silly enough or crazy enough to do it. <laughs> Well, it is. It is because, you know, that's the, you know, that's the quest of the pioneer. That's what made mm. us find new countries and new ways of using fire and flying and everything else. And I think it's just part of the, the nature of the human being to want to explore what we would call reality, you know, and it's, it's a vast, vast exploration. And uh, it seems like it's going to be going on for a very, very long time. And if it yes. was uh if if there's this if god is god then god doesn't seem in any hurry to give us the answer to the puzzles because there must be some um quite in uh, enjoyment f for this god to watch all this unfold <laughs> yeah i think the the uh, big thing for me is that science right now is progressing uh only in terms of the technology uh but what you need is to have the culture advance and the science together. The technology that we need will come from the, marrying the two together and the results should be far more uh, beneficial for life on Earth. Well, and there's another factor in there, and I think I might have touched on it in our first interview, and that is we have to advance our morality as we advance our science because we're at the point now where we're playing with forces great enough to destroy the planet. And yep. when you've got people like Bill Gates that are interested in money and money only at any expense and has the money to do anything he wants to do and hire any scientist he can get his hands on, you get people, <clears throat> you start looking into what he's doing with um, genetics and uh, genetic modification of plants and and biotech. I mean, these guys are they're playing with fire. And 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 That's when right. we don't have the morality to manage, we're kind of like teenagers with uh, machine guns, but don't really realize they actually kill people. That's right, or more like babies with razor blades. Yeah, exactly. And it's that's one of my big personal concerns is is mm. that. You know, we're we're seeing, you know, like Bill Gates decides he is going to spray aluminum in the skies to cool the planet down without any government approval, without the people even having a say in that. Yet <laughs> breathing aluminum is a great way to ruin your immune system and cause tremendous amounts of disease in every living creature out there. But all of a sudden he just decides he's going to do that. And no one gets in his way. I mean, the, the, the list of stuff going on like this. That's why I quoted the book Oneness Versus the One Percent by Von Donna Shiva, because she lays Bill Gates out on the table in a way that's shocking and extremely revealing and deeply concerning, because it's showing very clearly that he has enough money to control governments, police forces, medical systems, CDCs, World Health Organizations, United Nations, and anybody he wants. And, and mm. when you get someone like that playing with advanced science and the power that we have, you're in a very, very dangerous situation. Yes, the culture has to change. Yes, and I hope the pain teacher isn't what inflicts the change. Yes, we have a bad habit of um, <laughs> repeating 
the catastrophes of the past, but visiting our, on ourselves rather than uh, coming from some external source. Yes. Well, Walt, it's been a uh, phenomenal two interviews, and I'm very grateful for your time and, and your patience with me and all my wild and crazy questions. And, <laughs> um, you know, and, and, uh, thank you for entering dialogue with me and, and, uh, really, you know, I'm also very grateful that you treated me as a human being and, and entertained my questions as a student and didn't kind of push me off like some nose high higher ups tend to do when people are asking them questions they don't like to be asked. So I'm grateful for your, your openness and your honesty and all these things. Where, where can people find out more about the Thunderbolts project and the electric universe? The main source is the thunderbolts.info website. Uh, my own personal website, which is more of a historical uh, resource showing the development of ideas, is holoscience.com. It's uh, a kind of a, a form of holistic science. In other words, there are no boundaries to it. Beautiful. Last question I have to ask you. What what do you intuit is going to be the next great discovery in the Electric Universe uh, project? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, understanding gravity is a very important one because that changes our view of the Earth and uh, our, how it's structured um, in, a, in a dramatic way. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, so it would uh, change our thinking about uh, what we can do to the Earth and uh, also uh, what experiments might be performed to explore that idea further and that is of hollow celestial bodies. Uh, it, um, the discoveries of new space ventures are the most immediate ones, like the Parker probe to the sun. Uh, it will find more surprises. Each space probe always finds surprises because there's no predictive power to the... Uh, the common narrative today. Um, well, there's so much going on, but my main effort right now is to get the book written, which is designed to change the world. And as uh, Steve Jobs said, and I, I, I believe he's correct, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Yes. Well, I'm doing the same thing, just so you know. I'm working That's on it. my new yeah. book, and it's going to be a book that helps people see the world from a variety of different perspectives. Mm. But really, it's 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 my shot at taking my life's research and experience at trying to say, why are we all here? What are we doing? And giving people some tools they can use to navigate the earth plane so that they can create more of what they want and have more freedom and less of what they don't want and less bondage to dogmas and ideas. And it really interestingly hovers a lot around the word intention. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very so, good. Very beautiful. Um, if I get a chance or you want to talk about something, maybe when your new book comes out, you want to do a podcast and share some of the highlights, please let me know. It's been a fantastic journey with you and I'm very grateful for all the work and you and all the Thunderbolts and Electric Universe scientists and contributors are doing. So I, 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 a deep bow to you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Walt Thornhill. You can find more about Walt's work online at thunderbolts.info and hollowscience.com or connect with him via Facebook at wall.thornhill. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck or on his YouTube podcast channel youtube.com forward slash living4d with Paul Check. 
watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to check videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chikiva.com.